do you think that for some of the cinematic presentations, right, even more than TV, that some of the villains that they have chosen are almost too big as a start, and that maybe for something like the Fantastic Four, instead of doing Galactus right off the back, that maybe the mole man or a lesser villain within the ff history would have been better uh, absolutely my fantastic four trilogy would have been the mole man in the first movie would have been the origin and the mole man the second movie would have been dr doom and the third movie would have been galactus and the silver surfer that's the way i would have done a trilogy that's not how they decided to do it you know nobody asked me i i, I they <laughs> god knows I'll give them my phone number if they want Ron's opinion, but, but no <laughs> asking me. Let me ask you, Ron. What, so, what are you up to now with respect to 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 work? Uh, do you still get the opportunity to work and to, to do comics and um, uh, and uh, and how's that been? And, and, and absolutely. I mean, I'm still I'm working with an outfit now out of California called Sit Comics. Uh, run by a gentleman named Darren Henry, who has experience writing uh, for television. Uh, primarily, he has worked in sitcoms, which is why he called it sit comics. But it's uh, it's he's a child of the set. He's a child of the Marvel seventies. So he is doing you know really traditional comic book tropes with a with, with some kind of a sitcom twist to it. You know, he's, mm. he's always got something, there's a little, there's a little twist to it that makes it very unique. And as a writer, his voice is very unique. He's bringing in other writers, uh, like Todd DeZago and Dave Michelini and Roger Stern and Tom DeFalco. Uh, I'm working wow. on a character called Blue Baron that uh, is a, a very traditional uh, superhero, but again, it's got a twist to it that uh, is very enjoyable. And it, he's he's I'm I'm proud to be a part of the the uh, the effort because he he wants to do all ages comics. He's doing some humor books, he's doing a horror anthology, um, but he's doing uh, quite a few superhero titles, and he's doing a a, a team uh, collecting the the solo characters. Uh, in this case, it's the Heroes Union that um, it has been a lot of fun, uh, a lot of fun for me to work on. He is on the verge of, of uh, closing the deal to have these things distributed. And they're already, if you go to sitcomics.net, you can either order them through the mail or you can see them on Comixology digitally. But he's on the verge of having them distributed through Diamond, which I can't wait for because wow. I can't wait for other people to see these books because they're a lot of fun. And if you enjoyed Marvel in the, the 70s and 80s, I, I can guarantee you will enjoy these titles. Although the the uh, the attitude and the the, the the actual writing of it is very fresh and and, and modern. So uh, that's one of that's my main storytelling, my primary storytelling uh, uh, job now. Um, I also, you know, occasionally we, we get called to do things for one shots at Marvel and stuff. We did a 10 page Spider-Man story. We got the band back together to Falco and Sal Buscema, oh, wow. 10 page Spider-Man story a while back for a one shot. And, uh, actually we just got called, uh, not all that long ago, I guess about a year ago to do, uh, <coughs> a 10 page Thunderstrike story. Oh, wow. <laughs> for a for a, uh, a one shot called Thor the Worthy. And they did a, a Jane Foster story and a Beta Ray Bill story. And they called DeFalco and I, and we got Keith Williams on as anchor. Sal was unable to do it um, for a 10 page. Not, it, it was, and they didn't want Kevin as Thunderstrike, they wanted Eric. So we did a 10 page Eric story that kind of fits in between you know Eric's uh, career as a superhero and stuff. That and sounds fantastic. Those that sounds cool. Oh, looking for it. There should be. I mean, there should be copies around. There were there were a couple of different covers. Walt did a cover, and I forget who did the other cover, but uh, it's called Thor the Worthy, and 
you know, I, I, I don't know how it sold and I don't know if there's any plans on doing anything else with that kind of a thing, but it was a one shot that they did for some reason a while back. And uh, it was fun. It was fun getting, it, back, you know, doing the character. If you, if Tom had a brilliant, you know, idea to do a Spider-Man storyline, he had you on board as artist and Sal on board as inker. I mean, that's a, that's a powerful team. Could he go, you know, could you guys go to Marvel and say, look, Give us a shot to do this story. This, this, you know, story to to is that possible? Say that I just don't know whether Marvel would be interested in it. And, gotcha. and we may. Uh, the other thing that happens too is that the budgets are different now than they used to be. Oftentimes, some of the old guys don't get called because the uh, the budgets aren't the same as they used to be. They, they less or more. They, yeah, they they don't less. Um, they don't, uh, I mean, there are still the superstars that are getting good money, yeah. but for the most part, the industry isn't doing well enough for, for the rank and file to get the kind of rates that we were getting before. Wow. So a lot of the young editors assume that, you know, these guys are not going to work for the money that they, that they can offer. Um, you know, a lot of us would be willing to hear what they can pay and decide sure. for but, and that's one of the things that frustrates me about the comics business is that I've never gotten a call from an editor who said, this is what we can afford to pay. Mm. Are you interested? Um, usually they're aware of what your rate is and they can either swing it or they can't. Um, you know, DeFalco and I were brought on board one job and I forget which one it was. But at one point they were saying that the budget couldn't afford Sal. And I said to Tom, I said, well, I'd be willing to take a page rate to get Sal on this thing. And he goes, don't wow. say anything yet. He said, they can, they can find the money. <laughs> and of course, <laughs> Tom was editor in chief, so he knows how these things work. So Absolutely. I got advice and they did get Sal for us, you know, that kind of thing. But there have been other situations where, you know, it's been made clear that if they're gonna pay Tom's rate, they're gonna pay my rate, they may not be able to afford Sal or Brett Breeding or somebody like that, you know, that we might have to, to sure. To, to to go with somebody that's willing to work for less so it's it's interesting that way i mean i i'm really glad that i mean mark bagley has had an incredible career i mean he's back and now yeah. for crying out loud. and i you know he's a I, I i like the guy a lot personally i haven't seen him in decades but i i always liked him personally and i wish him a lot of luck and i think it's great that he's still respected the way he is I'm not sure it really comes down to respect as much as availability or viability or what they think is sellable. I really don't know how they make those decisions. But, you know, I mean, in the same way that, you know, the guys that I admired kind of rotated out. I mean, I'm now that guy that's rotating out. That's all there is to it. You know, I mean, you don't, you don't expect it to last ever. Sure. And you look for other things to do. On top of sitcomics, I'm I'm very happy with uh, kind of a secondary career uh, doing commissions through Catskill. I was going to ask you about that. Yeah, I, that's that's uh, that's a powerful that I that I discovered and found Scott Cress, and Scott Cress found me because he's an incredible professional that handles all the orders, and you know when I need another raft of commissions, he just hands them to me. Uh, we have some people on a wait list, which is very gratifying. And, you know, in a way, it's kind of living off of the, the 30 year career that I had, you know, it's, it's a reputation, but I'm glad that that opportunity is there to, to still connect with fans. And, uh, and once I got on Facebook, that was really why I wanted to get on Facebook was I saw that Pat Olive was using it to keep his fans uh, abreast of what he was doing and what comics might be coming out and all this kind of stuff. So I wanted to do that one for the sitcomics material, but also for, uh, you know, like when we do Thunderstrike, uh, a Thunderstrike 10 pager or something, you know, I'll do a lot of exactly. things about it, let people know it's coming out and when it comes out and everything. But that's really, I, I, my page on Facebook has nothing very personal on it at all. It's all very uh, career oriented and uh, comics oriented. We'll certainly put a link uh, on your of your Facebook page onto this onto this YouTube video so that people yeah, can get. Yeah, if yeah, if they find it fun, so. if someone wanted to get a commission from you, what do they do? Do they go to your website? What what do they do? 
They go to CatskillComics.com. Uh, okay. And it's all one word, Catskill Comics. And they will see a homepage that has a list of all the people that are members of Catskill Comics. And they'll click on my name and they'll go to my page and they will see rates for all different kinds of uh, commissions. Uh, we do have a wait list right now that I'm trying to chip away on. But, wow. Uh, well, the summer has been bizarre because of COVID, because of the fact that all the conventions were canceled. Uh, sure. We have kind of bizarrely benefited from that because all the people that had all the, that were saving up money to go to conventions and get sketches there, <laughs> coming to the websites and uh, getting from uh, getting them from us there. So, um, you know, I'm a little backed up, but I look at it as job security. So, you oh, know, that's, yeah, you're, yeah. that means you're as busy. If you're backed up, you're as busy as ever. You're as, you're as. I, it was, I, I am still able to make a living drawing, uh, superheroes and uh i couldn't ask for anything more than that i mean that's awesome i'm i'm like i said i'm very eager for these books to get out in front of a mass audience they've gotten out in front of quite a few people already and we've gotten some terrific reviews and i think you know the more people that see them the more people are going to love them so uh i'm really eager for people to to share in uh what we're doing over at sitcomics and uh I'm definitely, I'm definitely going to check that out. The, the danger in the industry is that many of us who are still very much fans have given up on the industry and have, have been disconnected from it. So we don't know when these little gems come out. Well, that's, and so, why so, I do, that's exactly why I did Facebook. And I, from what I'm told, the majority of fans from like my era who are still engaged in the characters tend to invest in either original art or a comics art or those oh, yeah, exactly. that behind you there. Exactly. Yes, sir. Uh, that, from what I've heard, that's the majority of the audience for those kinds of collectibles are guys who read in the 70s and 80s and into the 90s, but have since kind exactly. of walked away from the actual comics material and are now you know, living their love for the characters that way, you know. Which, which, which should be, yeah, it should be interesting for the industry. They should learn from that. Well, because if you notice, all these things will be the original depiction. Which is, so I guess, why they're doing a Thunderstrike action figure. It, it may well be. After he was canceled, you know. Okay. It may well be. The, uh, the one big thing um, that I've always wanted to know, and especially since you worked on the, uh, the original Marvel run in the book, Right. Was it, in your opinion, was it canceled prematurely? The Marvel run as a whole was it canceled um, for Star Wars? Uh, it was. Yeah, I mean, I think that was just a decision that was made. As as near as I can remember, that was a decision that was made by Lucasfilm. Really? Uh, yeah. Yeah. I they, always thought it was Marvel that pulled the plug I on it. I don't believe so because I, I don't know how the book was selling because I had moved off it and Joe was still writing it. Right. Uh, Cynthia Martin had come on. Yes, uh, I, re I remember. And, and, you know, but we were having more and more problems with uh, Lucasfilm because between movies, they would keep us very in a very narrow tube because, you know, like one of the first things after the first movie that Dave Michelini wanted to do, one of his first plots past the movie, was it makes sense to him that the Empire would just try to build another Death Star. And so in one of his plots, he said, the Empire is going to build another Death Star. And Lucas <laughs> went, no, they're not. <laughs> you're, not think so. <laughs> you're not going to do another Death Star. So Dave went, oh, well, I guess that's going to be in one of the movies. Uh, you know, so there were a lot of those kinds of things that were happening a lot. I mean, just on my run with Joe, when we did the the Lasbies, the little right. creatures, they originally looked a lot more like Ewoks. I didn't know about Ewoks. We had no idea what an Ewok was, but we created these little furry teddy bear guys. Right. Over ears and stuff. And when Lucasfilm saw them, they freaked out. <laughs> And because I penciled the whole job and they looked at them and said, you can't, you can't do these. And they went, what, why? And so we're not going to tell you why, but you can't, you can't do these. So they had Tom 
Palmer when he inked it, right. he like changed them to make them look like kitty cats, make them more, look more like kitty cats. And they colored them pink and they colored them light blue and all this. I kind remember of the character, sir. Because the original characters would have been brown and would have looked more like teddy bears and they had big eyes and they were wearing, you know, leather clothing with laces and stuff. <laughs> and and that, they, were, they couldn't let us, and it was in the same issue that had Luke on a uh, hang glider. And when I, they a hang glider, I it, have the entire run, so I know what you're talking about. He accused of somehow getting a hold of the, the script for Return, which we what we didn't and you know they knew we didn't but there was a whole bunch of stuff there that you know we were constantly being told no you can't do that and we just assumed that okay well they're telling us we can't do it that must be something that's going to be in the movies so what happened was after return um i was on the book for like two or three issues after return and then um they took over joe took over with uh with 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 Cynthia Martin, and I think Lucas Lucasfilm just knew that it was going to be a while before there was going to be another movie. I mean, ultimately George decided, you know, how many years was it before he made the the prequel and stuff? Uh, it was roughly thirty two years. <laughs> there you go. And I so I think what ended up happening was that he just did not want. You know, there was already the novels that were becoming the extended universe and all this kind of stuff. And and my understanding was, I don't know how it was selling for Marvel, so maybe there was an element of the sales having dropped or something okay. with the movies. Not that's a possibility. I don't know for sure. Um, Joe Duffy's on Facebook. You could ask her. But uh, I, I think ultimately what it was was that Lucasfilm was not interested in riding herd on a creative endeavor where they would have trouble, they can't give you carte blanche. Right. And they don't really have a mechanism. Once the movies aren't being produced, they don't really have people that are gonna be hired to just read comic book plots and say no, you know, that kind of thing. So I think it was easier for them to just pull the plug, to tell you the truth. And, you know, I mean, then Dark Horse ended up picking it up and they started, you know, they, they, they were still doing other licensing and everything, but I. I always got the impression it was more on Lucasfilm's end. I could be completely wrong, Kevin. Thank you so much for clearing that up, no, though. I always I, thought it was. I was really sorry. Just to, Marvel. Yeah, I, I was really sorry to to leave the title because I really enjoyed working with Joe Duffy, and uh, it, it was a it was a tough decision for me to to leave Star Wars. But um, you know. It, yeah. Who's your favorite character, by the way? I'm curious. Like, who, who oh, as a kid, who were you a fan of oh, from a character point of view? Spider-Man. I, I was a big Spider-Man guy. Um, <clears throat> Star Wars, I'm a Luke guy. You know, I mean, I, I like Han, but Luke's my guy. Um, <laughs> but yeah, as far as Marvel characters, uh, I, I, Spider-Man was the first and always the, the most extreme. But I, I love Captain America. I would have loved to have done a run on Cap with, uh, with either Mark Boonwald or... or Oh, that would have been great. That would have been great. Um, for I sure. would, in fact, there was, you know, there was some loose talk. We were offered, we were sort of kind of offered cap while we were on. But um, I, I didn't feel, they, they weren't sure I could, and I didn't feel confident that I could do two books a month. So then I wasn't going to leave Thor. Hmm. So, I mean, we already had things that were in motion on Thor that I didn't want to give up on that stuff. Um, and, you know, I mean, it, 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 so, you know, some opportunities you just have to, you know, let them pass and hope maybe they'll come back around. I mean, at this point, I, working for the, the, the books, the way they're produced now, and, and it's something I wanted to circle back to, uh, what you were saying when you, when you decided you were going to be more judgy than I am about how the books are produced these days. <laughs> And I'll tell right. you where the the Terminator line is, where where the barrier is between finding Peter's voice and doing my Peter Parker. I can tell you exactly what attitude led to that shift. And it is when yes, please. Comics, it is when comics became art. Okay? As comics started to gain more respect and they were no longer disposable, mass market, 
uh, uh, entertainment. They became an art form, okay? Now, the one thing about art is that art is incredibly subjective. So mm. the industry that I was trained in was a very objective industry because objectively, you either tell the story clearly or you don't tell the story clearly. And editors can look at your work and objectively say, you are not telling the story clearly enough. So you need to do that better. You know, there were objective standards to what we were doing, producing our mass market entertainment. Once it became art, once it became self-expression, <clears throat> then, then the artist, be, be that the writer or the colorist or whoever, but the, the artist uh, becomes more important than the product, okay? We were always behind Indeed. the curtain. We were always the puppeteers behind the curtain. It was the character and the product that was important. And in the course Correct. of the, the, uh, the, the, the system that Stan set up where he started crediting the writers and artists and the writers and artists become more the point and you start following certain writers you like and you start, you know, certain writers have uh, more cachet and, and all this kind of stuff and certain artists can can come in and say i'd like to do spider-man for six issues and they go great or we'll start a new title for you or whatever yeah. you know then the art then the artist is more important than the art than than the than the story than the character and that's where people feel free to say well i'm going to do my peak because that's what i'm being asked to do i'm being asked to come in and be myself they're hiring me to come in and make Spider-Man, my version of Spider-Man. And, you know, as a, that once it's, once it's subjective, once you can't say, well, see, I can pick up any given issue and I don't know what the hell's going on because yes. they, they, everybody, you know, the big Stan Lee thing, the big Tom DeFalco thing, the big Jim Shooter thing was every issue needs to be somebody's first issue. Every, if you want, to continue building an audience, every issue has to be somebody's first issue. So every yes. issue should be clear enough and a, a solid enough unit, a single unit of entertainment for that person that they felt like they got their money's worth and that they yes. are included in what's going on. That the things are explained in the dialogue well enough, that things are explained in captions well enough or flashbacks or whatever, but that anybody who is getting on the train at that stop doesn't have to go back and collect all the other stops. That's right. And if not for that, many of us wouldn't have become Marvel fanatics, you know? Absolutely. I, every issue, I, I, I can remember like an early issue of an Avengers that I traded with Ken Mariana, who lived <laughs> that way, right? And in that issue, it was, it was Sal Buscema Inc. by Sam Granger. It was some of the most beautiful artwork I ever saw in my life. But in the course of that story, there were characters I had never seen before. One was Goliath, with, was, uh, was Goliath. One was Yellow Jacket, okay? But yeah. at one point, Roy Thomas has Goliath grow too big too fast, and he, he has a spasm and he collapses, and the growing man gets away. And then Yellow Jacket runs over to him, and Hawk, uh, and, uh, uh, Goliath says to Yellow Jacket, I guess I blew it, Hank. I'll never be the giant man that you were. And, and, uh, and Yellow Jacket says, I've never been prouder of the man that succeeded me as giant man. You know, that kind of thing. And I'm going, oh, as a new reader, I now know what Goliath used to be Hawkeye. <laughs> yes, and yes. Hank Pym is now Yellow Jacket. Right yes. there. In one little bit of dialogue, I know, I know what my big question is answered and I can move on and I'm included in this story, you know. Absolutely. And, and, and if I may interrupt, it also made you curious to want to find out when that change occurred. Absolutely. So there was a connection to the past as well, but, 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 but you, go on. You should, you should have to, you, you should want to buy back issues because you want to buy back issues, not because. Exactly. exactly. And when you pick up a new book now, you, you know, I've done it several times. I've attempted 
to like jump back in. One time I was like after the Avengers movie, I was in a, on an Avengers kick. I said, let me see where I can jump in. I went to a <laughs> really nice comic book store. There was a wall. I didn't even know which Avengers was the main title. Exactly. There were so many mini series and ancillary things going on that exactly. I couldn't tell which was the Avengers. Exactly. And it made me crazy. I mean, I and I asked somebody, and they're going, what do you mean? I said, I mean, which <laughs> one is the monthly Avengers title that was started by Stan and Jack and, you know, is going to go off into the future? And they're going, well, you know, there's been new number ones along the way, so I'm not quite sure what you were. I, I said, which one is the core Avengers title? <laughs> Did they know who there was a way to go? Did they know who they were talking to? I don't. Yeah, probably. The guy I was talking to probably did. But I, I just, I, I walked away. I mean, that, it's like, this is nuts. There have been a couple times when I've been, like, really excited where I'll read that a new team is on. I'm going, oh, that sounds cool. So I'll make a point to go out and buy a, a comic that, you know, but, but again, the characters are so different and so changed from the last time I saw them. And there's no attempt at all to help me catch up but, it, but if i may that's the point i was trying to make earlier when i dared to be judgy because it's a dangerous thing to be judgy uh, but that's the point that i made when you dilute the characters to such an extent it becomes diluted and no, you I lose don't that at all i don't yeah yeah, yeah. That at all. i mean that's one like i said i i like the the captain america movies because the the character that chris evans is playing is is Captain America to me, you know? I mean, uh, I that's Captain America. I don't know what, I just, I, in all fairness, I don't know what's going on in the books right now, but yeah. you know, I, I saw online all the furor when they did the thing with the cosmic cube and Hail Hydra and all this kind of stuff. And, you know, Captain America is a Nazi. And, 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 and people even came up to me and said, would you and Tom have ever made Jane Foster Thor? And I said, had we thought of it? Yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> you wouldn't have called her Thor. We would have called her something else. But yeah, I exactly. don't have a problem with a woman wielding Yelder, you know, that kind of thing. And Jane Foster was a good choice. Although I didn't, was she even in the books? I mean, I know the, she had been touched upon and it had been established had it been established already that Jane Foster had cancer before that number one? Or is that what I, uh, Not that I'm aware of. Oh, okay. So that was all brand new for, for that Thor, for that permutation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Definitely. The, the cancer one was, was related to that storyline. Yeah. I mean, but, but you would have, you may have come up with, a, with, with Jane Foster wielding the hammer and becoming a Thor, but I think you would have handled it differently. I think that it would have, it would have been that greater connection to the, to the mythos and to the history of the, of the character let, let rather tell, than just... Let, let me tell you one of the things that we did mm -hmm. right, that should become part of... Uh, it should be in a handbook somewhere. If you're going to do a legacy character, okay, if you're going to have Eric Masterson take over for Thor, or Kyle Rayner take over as the new Green Lantern, or any number of things. Sure. What we did right, purely by accident, is that when Eric took over as Thor, every moment of Eric's life was spent searching for the real Thor, and making it very clear to the reader that Eric yes. did not think he was Thor, he did yes. not think he was better than Thor, yeah. We, the, the, the narrator did not think he was better than Thor. That nobody yeah. who was observing him thought he was better than Thor. <laughs> That's he right. No way was successfully supplanting Thor. Okay? Um, you know, and I think they, they did something very similar with Kyle Rayner, because I was reading those books at the time, and uh, I thought they were succeeding in the same way, that they made Kyle Rayner a well-drawn character of his own, and it was no commentary on Hal Jordan that Kyle Rayner was now Green Lantern, you know, that's that, right. and, and you need to do that because the worst thing you can do when you're revamping a character that way, or, you know, trying to do a legacy version of that character for any period of time, because we always intended to bring Thor back. I mean, there was, there was never a question about that, but you cannot tell the Thor fans that they were wrong to like Thor. 
Exactly. You, know, you cannot be arrogant enough to say, oh, by the way, that stuff with that, uh, you know, all that uh, uh, Shakespearean dialect and all that kind of stuff, that was crap. And we're not going to do it anymore. And you were stupid to like it. And I'll tell you one of the reasons why that resonates with me, because one of the first jobs I had for Marvel, the first job I had for Marvel, was Kesar the Savage. Mm -hmm. And I loved the original Kesar stories. I loved the Kirby Kesar stories. I loved the stories that they did in Savage Tales in black and white with Stan Lee and John Buscema. I loved everything about the original Kesar stories. And when they offered me Kesar, I was like, are you kidding me? I love Kesar. Bruce Jones was doing something completely different with Kesar at the time. Uh, people have kind of lovingly called it Kesar, the middle-aged accountant. <laughs> he was having like a, a, a midlife crisis and Shanna was there and they, were, they would bicker back and forth. And it was kind of a, you know, the, the book was very much about their relationship and everything. And, and there was some action and adventure and some really good stuff. But Kesar wasn't the third person Kesar, stronger than the giant boar, stronger than the mastodon, you know. And I loved that character, but everything about those books was telling me I was stupid. Yeah. Like in yeah. the original KSR. Yeah. <laughs> and a couple of times I would approach Louise and I said, could we do a story where we explain how my KSR became Bruce's KSR? Mm. And she says, do you have a story in mind? I said, I said, in, the, in broad strokes, I'm thinking like there's this village that his, his buddy Tonga is from, you know, and he knows this village very well. He feels it's one of the places in the Savage Land. He feels at home. And they are raided by some massive raider party that one man could not hope to defeat. And he comes over the hill with Zabu and he sees the village burning and he comes in and he's trying to be Kesar, and he's trying to get a handle on this, but the raiders slaughter most of the people in the village, including the people he was closest to, and he can't do it. He feels impotent. He can't do a thing to stop them, and they ride off, and the village is burning around him, and he's broken. He couldn't do it, and he reverts. You know, he realizes... Wow. Wow. He realizes that, <clears throat> what, am, what am I doing? <laughs> you know, I mean, because Kesar was always very aware of civilization. Absolutely. He was always very aware. What I loved about the Stan John Buscema stuff is that he, he, he knew civilization, but, you know, only in civilization does man kill and call it sport. Only yeah. in civilization do you pollute your own yeah. air and water. Only in civilization, you know, do you treat each other uh, like, uh, like chattel, you know, that kind of thing. He said, I know civilization and I spit on it, you know, that kind of thing. And so I, I, I figured the only way to do this was to like put him in a situation where he realizes that he, he isn't Lord of the jungle. He isn't stronger than the mastodon, stronger than the giant boar, you know, that he feels completely impotent and it scares him and so then Bruce's story become him regaining himself, you know, that kind of thing. And Louise listened very politely and then said, we're never- No gonna... way, oh, come on. And, and I said, well, you know, cause like there was a scene in one of the stories where he, he goes nuts, he thinks Shannon is dead and he goes nuts and he snaps and he kills this creature and throws it into this spike pit, you know, that kind of thing. And, in the course of that story, I liner noted when he goes savage, I liner noted him saying, stronger than the mastodon, stronger than the giant boar, mighty as Kesar, Lord of the Jungle. You know? <laughs> and, and, it was, and it was completely ignored because I don't know if Bruce even knew what it was referring to, because I don't know if he read the old stuff. And you know, I would have those conversations with Louise and Louise said, Ron, believe me, I understand where you're coming from. But nobody cares. This looks like a job for Superman. Hey, look! 
It's Spider-Man! The dynamic, the dynamic duo, duo returns. Return. Next, Next week, don't, don't miss it.